thanks for joining us for this Part B Ophthalmology Common Rejections and Denials webinar. This presentation today is designed for those who submit claims on the CMS 1500 claim form or the 837P electronic version. My name is Mary Moko. I'm a specialist on the Provider Outreach and Education team at WPS Health Solutions. I will be your host today. Assisting me is my friend and colleague, Karen Curtis. We include this disclaimer in all our education and we do so to remind learners that although we made every effort to provide current information that is correct, the information is subject to change. It is on the CMS website where you will find the Medicare rules that determine final coverage. These laws, regulations, and rulings will always prevail. We will provide responses to questions based on the facts given. And finally, a reminder, CMS prohibits recording of this presentation for profit-making purpose. We are recording this webinar and we will post it as an encore presentation. You can stay informed about new postings of the latest encore presentations and other education events by reading the education news we post each week on Wednesday. Here is the agenda for today. This webinar does focus specifically on the data that we analyzed for common rejections and denials on Part B claims submitted by specialty type 18 providers, and that specialty is ophthalmology. During today's presentation, and just as we advertised, I will define rejections and denials. I'm going to review the data for common rejections and denials for this specialty, and I'm going to discuss how you can affix or how you can fix rather and avoid both. And I will along the way provide some great resources as well as review some of those provider resources at the end of my prepared remarks today. Here is a copyright notice and this is the copyright notice we provide for the American Medical Association. Your continued participation in this webinar infers that you agree to the terms of this copyright notice. Should you not agree to acknowledge this copyright notice, you may disconnect now from this webinar. So let's get started with today's webinar. Now to fully understand rejections and denials, it's important to recognize the path that a claim takes or what we like to call the life of a claim. This is a simplified graphic on how a claim gets into our system. The provider or supplier renders the service, submits the claim, but the system might reject the claim or claim badge. Now when this occurs, Medicare generates and sends a 277 or 999 report. We're going to talk about that just a little bit. This slide describes the claim submission in more detail. Most providers submit claims electronically and very few qualify for a waiver under a law that prohibits Medicare from making payment on a claim that is not submitted electronically. Now to confirm claim receipt, providers should use the 999 report. Use the 277 report for more specific information. Our electronic data interchange or EDI staff created the Medicare 276-277 companion guide. It is this guide that will help clarify and further define the data content requirements for an electronic claim. Now, based on both reports, you will know if the claim is rejected and if you need to correct or resubmit the claim or the badge. Here is a simplified graphic that shows what happens to a claim that Medicare deems as unprocessable. So the claim has already been accepted into our system. However, something is missing or invalid or incorrect, which makes it unprocessable. This slide shows a slide-by-side -side comparison 
uh, side by side comparison rather of a claim rejection as opposed to a claim denial and they really are two different things. You have different actions to choose to make corrections when there is a rejection versus a denial. So it's really important that you understand there is a difference. Even internally, I think sometimes our staff mixes up rejection and denial when you're talking about rejections and denials, uh, but you really need to keep them straight and differentiate between the two of them. So for a rejected claim, the claim is deemed as unprocessable. And what that means is that it's returned on what we call the front end. It's never really processed. Uh, it's missing something, there's incorrect or invalid or illogical information, and because these claims are never processed, uh, there are no appeal rights, or adjudicated is what I should say, they're never adjudicated, so there's no appeal rights. What you need to do is resubmit the service, fix it and resubmit it. Now on the remittance advice, there will be an MA-130, and a C016 code and the MA130 just states and describes that the claim contains incomplete or invalid information. Uh, there's no appeal rights because the claim is unprocessable. It also states that you need to submit a new claim with the complete or correct information. And that C016 or C016 rather, it is an O not a zero, is a group code and that stands for contractual obligation. And what this means is that the uh, patient is not liable for the charges because you need to submit a new claim. Now a denial on the other hand is a claim that has been adjudicated and the reason for the denial could be uh, one of many. Um, there's some listed here on this slide. It could be due to uh, the fact that it doesn't meet payment criteria based on a law. Uh, we call those statutory requirements. Perhaps the information reported on the claim doesn't meet Medicare's medical necessity guidelines. Medical necessity actually includes any frequency parameters or utilization parameters. Also, uh, another reason a claim may denial could be due to eligibility. Now, when you have a claim that denies, there will be an MA01 code that appears appears on the remittance advice and what that code does is notify the provider of the appeal rights for that particular claim. Now with very few exceptions there are appeal rights when a service is denied. And of course for denied claims the patient liability is determined. Here is yet another graphic showing the path for a processed claim. Uh, the claim, the service is provided, of course, by the provider, the practitioner. Uh, the service is submitted to Medicare, and Medicare will either pay or deny the claim. And when that occurs, the remittance advice is generated. And I want to talk about the remittance advice here just for a minute. Uh, sometimes people shorten this up a bit and call it the RA. Uh, sometimes we refer to this as the remittance notice, and you'll even hear people call it the remit. Most providers receive an electronic remittance advice, or an ERA, as opposed to a paper remittance, or standard paper remittance, what we call the SPR. Now the ERA includes details about the transfer of funds and payment processing from Medicare to the health care provider's bank. Now depending on how the claim is processed, it may include other information. It could include uh, adjustments that were made to the claim. It could include denial information. It might also include information about something that's missing. Sometimes it provides notice about refunds and even offsets. When looking at a remittance advice, there are codes that provide information about the claim. Claim adjustment reason codes explain why a claim paid differently than was billed. And remittance advice remark codes uh, provide more details about an adjustment described by a claim adjustment reason code. Now another type of code that appears on the remittance advice is a group code, and I talked about one already, uh, that C016. Uh, group codes convey the financial responsibility for any unpaid portion of a claim balance. So a CO or a group code beginning with CO 
uh, means contractual obligation, and that means the provider is liable and can't bill the patient for that service. A PR group code, or one that starts with PR, uh, means the patient is financially responsible. You can find code lists on the Washington Publishing Company's website. They are the contractor that maintains the codes for CMS. You can find links on their web page or on their website. I've got those listed here and linked or embedded links uh, in your handout so that you can find those if you're interested in taking a look at them. Now, one thing I wanted to say about codes is that we understand that some of the codes, those reason and remark codes, may be a little cryptic or may have out of date acronyms in them. Uh, for example, some of the code messages may include an outdated acronym such as HICFA, which stood for, at one time, the Healthcare Financing Administration, that's now known as CMS. Uh, we understand that some may seem out of date and some of the information I've included in this presentation will include exactly that information as you see it on the remittance advice. So while I know and acknowledge that some of the acronyms that I'm going to talk about during this presentation are outdated, the reason is because this is how those codes print out on the remittance advice. Now, after reviewing the remittance advice, you are going to need to choose the action that you need to take to fix, correct, or resubmit, or even request an appeal for a denied service. Now, for an unprocessable or rejected claim, you're going to need to fix the error and resubmit the claim to Medicare. If the claim or claim line denied, there may be multiple actions to choose from. You might be able to simply resubmit the service. You might also be able to use a clerical error reopening or what we call the SER process, C-E-R. Uh, this is a process that CMS defines uh, that you can take to correct a clerical error. And clerical errors include minor omissions, minor errors, um, these are human or mechanical errors on the part of the party or the contractor, and I'll talk more about that process a bit later in this webinar. Another action to consider, of course, if a claim denies versus rejects, is an appeal. The remittance advice is going to provide those appeal rights, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in this program as well. Now, registered users can use our transactional portal to render a clerical error reopening or to request an appeal. And these are self-service tools that really do offer the most efficiencies. Now, our portal user manual provides illustrations and step-by-step -step instructions on how to use these portal features as well as other functionalities of that self-service tool. Here are just a couple of CMS resources that I did want to include about the remittance advice if you'd like more information about it. Next I want to talk about when you need to correct or appeal the MAX decision to pay or deny a claim. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the acronym MAC or MAC, it stands for Medicare Administrative Contractor. WPS is the MAC for jurisdictions 5 and 8. I talked earlier about the clerical error reopening process and I told you that I would share more details later in this webinar. This is the process to correct those human or mechanical errors, those minor errors. Uh, clerical errors or minor error, errors rather are limited to errors in form and content. They are not omissions such as when you fail to bill for certain items or services. Your handout includes a link to the resource titled how to request a clerical error reopening. 
it includes some examples of acceptable clerical error submissions. Uh, just to name a couple of those, transposed procedure or diagnostic codes, misapplication of a fee schedule, uh, computer errors, mathematical, computational mistakes, and so on and so forth. These are some examples of acceptable clerical error submissions. And remember, you can render a clerical error reopening using the self-service capabilities in our transactional portal. There are also in that resource that's linked here on this uh, slide some examples of situations that cannot be processed as a clerical error reopening. Some examples of those are provider enrollment issues, uh, claim denial due to a no response to a development request, wrong payee situations, and also some complex claim situations. Uh, and what we mean by that, or what I mean by that, is when a not otherwise classified code is billed or an NOC code is billed, claims with modifiers 22, 53, 55, just to name a couple. Those complex claim situations where we really do need to look at your medical record documentation to make a determination of coverage. Now remember, you can use the portal for self-service or you can request a clerical error reopening via telephone or fax. And remember that portal user manual that I talked about provides your instructions should you choose the self-service option. Here is the information I told you I would include about appeals. I told you I'd mention it a little bit later in the presentation when I talked about it earlier. There are five levels of appeals. Uh, there is only one level of an appeal that is rendered by the MAC. Uh, that is the first level called the redetermination. For each of those five levels of appeals, there are time limits for submitting and for completing an appeal. Uh, there are also monetary thresholds for filing uh, at two of those levels, level three and level five. And we call those monetary thresholds amounts in controversy. And based on a law, these amounts, these monetary amounts, can change from year to year. Most times they do change, but I have seen some years where there was no change. You can check out how to appeal a claim determination on our website. It is a resource. Uh, I've included the link on the next slide, actually. Uh, here it is. Um, and this is a great resource, that first bulleted item there, how to appeal a claim determination. Um, it includes details about who can rest or uh, who can request an appeal. Both the beneficiary or their representative can request an appeal on any service that is processed for them. Providers and suppliers, on the other hand, can appeal services for which they accepted assignment. But for unassigned claims, a provider or supplier may act as the beneficiary's representative, but only if that beneficiary signs an authorization statement. Providers and suppliers can also request a redetermination, that level one appeal, on an unassigned claim if Medicare denied the service as not medically necessary or when the provider or supplier billed in excess of the limiting charge. And when that happens, of course, the provider or supplier would need to refund any fees collected from the beneficiary in excess of that limiting charge. And remember, we recommend using the self-service options for more efficiencies. Now, in addition to the uh, link to that resource on the WPS website, I want to share with you one of my favorite appeals resources. I like to share this whenever I talk about appeals with any audience, and that is the CMS fee-for-service appeals process flowchart. You can see an example of it over on the right-hand side of this particular slide. You can see that this is for original Medicare, so parts A and B, fee-for-service Medicare items and services. And this particular appeals process flowchart includes both the standard and the expedited processes. The standard process is for parts A and B, and the expedited process appeals, or excuse me, not appeals, applies uh, for some part A only appeals. You can see all five levels of appeal are shown here on this flowchart. It gives you the days you have to file. Um, 
each level of appeal. It tells you the days that the uh, decision needs to be made. Uh, it also tells you the name of the contractors that uh, render the decisions on each of the levels. And it also provides for you those dollar thresholds that I talked about on two levels. Level three is the ALJ hearing, the Office of Medicare Appe Hearings and Appeals. And you can see here on this slide that the amount in controversy is equal to or greater than $180. And then federal district court is that fifth and last level of appeal where the amount in controversy is $1,840. If you look to the bottom of this flow chart that is updated annually on CMS's website, um, you will see that it does identify for you the calendar year. The last sentence reads, this chart or the chart reflects the amounts for calendar year 2024. So if you're using this tool like I like to use it, uh, make certain if it's if it's a new year that you are making certain that CMS has updated this flow chart that has appeared for years out on their website. It's a great tool. All right, this then brings us to the next portion of my presentation. Uh, it includes a discussion of the data that I used to provide the most common rejections and denials for specialty 18, ophthalmology. So the data that I'm sharing today is all specialty 18 submitted claims for jurisdiction five, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and jurisdiction eight, Indiana and Michigan, part B claims. So uh, this is all of the states in our jurisdictions collectively. Now, while the dashboard allows us, this claims uh, dashboard uh, allows us to drill down by a specific state or states and even counties, I pulled data for our entire jurisdiction, just as I mentioned. I call this tool the dashboard. That's what we call it internally. And it's actually, um, set up by our data informatics team um, who has made this information available to uh, provider outreach and education staff, people like Karen and I, so that we can take a look at the rejections and denials in our jurisdictions to help us determine the need for education. Uh, CMS in their internet only manuals makes it very clear that we are to provide education based on the data. And that's what this webinar is about today. And that's what I advertised. We're not talking about um, necessarily um, the coverage criteria within a policy. We're talking about the data that shows the most commonly denied rejections and denials and how you can fix or avoid them. So for those of you that are wondering what specialty 18 is, because I've mentioned that a few times now, it is a code assigned to WPS providers when they enroll. During enrollment, providers will self-designate a specialty. And while a provider can designate a secondary specialty, it is only that primary specialty, the one designated, self-designated, that is used during initial claim processing. Now there's some situations where a provider will request an appeal, they'll stipulate their secondary specialty, and then Medicare can consider payment. Now specialty code 18 is ophthalmology, so I pulled data um, using that dashboard that our uh, informatics team, or we call them Insight, uh, has made available for us. Uh, and it's actually, you can use various slicers, you know, drop down menus to choose the data that you want to see. And literally in the time it takes you to snap your fingers, this data can change based on the information in those slicers. In other words, do you want to see only Part A information? Do you want to see Part B information? Do you want to see um, rejections? Do you want to see denials? Do you want to see both? Uh, do you want to see services only in Kent County, Michigan? Um, do you want only Michigan? Do you want only Indiana? And so on and so forth. So you can see what I'm talking about. They refer to those drop down items that we can mine that data by as slicers. So we can use various slicers. 
Um, for the information I looked at, I used Specialty 18, Part B only claims. I looked at rejections and then I looked at denials. The submission dates, or the dates uh, of the claim submissions is April 1, 2024 through June 30 of 2024. Those are submission dates, folks, not dates of service. The data that I looked at was last refreshed on July 12th. Uh, when I prepared this presentation. Um, that was the latest and greatest information I could get. Um, that means that any claims submitted for April 1 through June 30th after July 12th won't be included in this data. They do update the data every month in that dashboard for us, uh, but the information I used was um, last refreshed in July. So here then, um, just as I promised or as I advertised, um, our, I'm revealing those most common rejections by reason uh, for specialty 18 providers, Part B providers in our jurisdictions. The first one um, is, and it's no surprise, over 7,000 rejections for those slicers used for the, the data that I analyzed, um, states claim lacks information needed for adjudication. And this is um, this is a message that you're going to see on the remittance notice on all, for rejected claims or unprocessable claims. But there will also be additional codes or reason codes that provide more detail about the rejection. The second most commonly rejected by reason uh, rejection reason, I should say, uh, is the second one. And notice that first word there. Uh, and this is where I told you a little bit earlier on in my presentation that sometimes these descriptions that print out are cryptic or they receive or, or they include, you know, outdated information. I'm talking about rejections right now. And I told you earlier, rejections and denials are very different. This reason code for rejections prints out denied. Um, so that first word, and you'll see that also in the, the second to the last and the last bullet. These are not denials, folks. These are rejections. The reason these show is that this is how the information that I mined in that data um, shows up. These are the reason codes and the remarks codes that you're going to see on your remittance advice. But the second most common rejection is that field 11 of the HICFA 1500 there's that outdated acronym, folks. We know it's now the CMS 1500 must be completed. Uh, what this item on the claim form is, is it asks you, is there another insurance primary to Medicare? You can't leave this field blank. It must be completed. Um, if there is no other insurance that's primary to Medicare, you must enter the word none. You can't leave it blank. The third common rejection by reason is that the claim must be submitted to RRB, and RRB stands for Railroad Retirement Board. Uh, this is a rejection that's very common because the claim is submitted to WPS, your MAC, when it needs to be submitted to Palmetto GBA. Palmetto GBA is the, the MAC that processes claims for railroad retirees. So Railroad Retirement Board um, is where you need to submit the claim. It is Palmetto. It's another contractor. It is not WPS. So fix it, resubmit it. Um, 680 claims rejected for those three months for Specialty 18 claims. Uh, we have some resources that I'm going to talk about a little later on in this presentation that will help you know where you need to submit that claim if you don't have the address for the Railroad Retirement Board. Also, when you are looking at a Medicare beneficiary's Medicare card, um, for railroad retirees, you're going to see Railroad Retirement Board printed along the bottom of their Medicare card. Um, next common rejection, missing, incomplete, or invalid ordering primary identifier. So uh, what you'll need to do to avoid this type of rejection is, you know, make sure that the, the provider number was entered correctly. Make sure that it's there. Um, it needs to be there. Uh, verify ma uh, numbers match up, that your rendering number um, matches up with your billing numbers. Verify the location information for your providers is correct in your provider enrollment records to avoid these types of rejections. Next is invalid or missing modifier. On the WPS website, 
um, out in, um, we have a modifiers web page, and I do want to show you how to get to that. Um, you go to topic centers, or of course you could use the search on the on the right hand side of the claim. But if you're going into the topic center to find modifiers, you would need to select claims. Um, choose your jurisdiction. I'm just, this is a Part B webinar today. I'm going to choose J8 Part B just because it's right there. I'm going to accept the licensure agreement and then scroll down the guides and resources page to find, oh, I went too fast, modifier. Choose modifiers and here is our modifiers web page. There's general modifier information, ASC modifiers for ambulatory surgical centers, ambulances there, bilateral modifiers. You can see some are by specialty, uh, some uh, discontinued procedure modifiers, documentation modifiers, and so on. So we've kind of grouped these or categorized these. Uh, so if you need to find a modifier fact sheet, this is where you'd go. Um, there are surgery modifiers listed here. Uh, I know that some of you in your registration asked for information on modifier 54 and 55, and we are not talking about those modifiers during today's presentation, but I will tell you that we have fact sheets available for both of them. I'll just show you an example of the modifier 54 fact sheet. It includes the definition, appropriate uses, inappropriate uses, and then any additional information that might be helpful for you to determine when it's correct or not correct to use this modifier as well as resources. So that folks is where you can find the information on our modifiers. Now if you're submitting a claim to Medicare and you want to know if the information is required on our claim, we talked about field 11. Um, if you choose in quick links on our homepage EDI, that's Electronic Data Interchange, and scroll down and you have links to this document that I'm going to show you in a minute in your handout so you won't need to go navigate to it like I am but here is Medicare EDI I talked earlier about those um, companion guides the 277 276 that's available here in these companion guides it explains to you um, the formatting for a claim what's required um, what the content is required um, when you're submitting an electronic claim. But I do want to show you this crosswalk while I'm out here on this page. And what this does, folks, is it crosswalks a paper claim to an electronic claim form. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Hopefully it won't make your, your eyes go buggy. Um, and if it does, I apologize. Um, so for example, if in claim form instructions or if in instructions it tells you to place information on, in item no, number 19 on a paper claim form you would look here for item number 19 and it would tell you the requirements for the electronic claim form over here in the right hand column provides for you the data element description the loop um, and information needed uh, to submit a claim correctly um, and the one thing I want to point out here is you'll see all of these S's in the status column. Uh, on this page you'll see right here is an R. If you are looking at this and you st see status for this uh, in this status column you'll see an S and R. I got to back up here, get a little tongue-tied. Um, this is what this means is that the information is either required or situational on a claim. So R means that the data element is needed in order to process your claim. So that means, folks, if you don't include that data element on your claim, what's going to happen? It's going to be unprocessable. Okay? S is situational. So this will help you determine when you need to include information in a particular uh, data element or uh, loop on the electronic claim form and when you don't. So you, you have to have a principal diagnosis code on your claim. That's why this says required. Now, if you have multiple diagnosis codes, um, there's S's there to indicate that it's situational. Uh, but this is a great tool that a lot of people don't know about, and I like to share that with my audiences. All right, uh, we talked about modifiers. This one, this next one, is very similar to the fourth bullet here. The rendering physician number is invalid or missing. Submit a new claim. Again, verify the number was entered correctly. Make certain that numbers are matching up, your rendering number, your billing number, and make sure the location information on the claim matches the provider enrollment record information. 
More common rejections by reasoning, missing information needed to adjudicate the claim. Um, that means there's some required information required on the claim that you didn't submit. You can use that uh, crosswalk tool that I just showed you to determine what's missing. Code and or modifier invalid for this date, submit new claim. Uh, make certain that if you're reporting a CPT code um, that the date of service matches um, or allows you to report that particular CPT code. CM or CPT does their annual updates. Um, you know, make certain that your, your codes are valid on the date of service. Similarly, make sure that the modifier is valid as well. Facility, laboratory name and address or PIN missing. Um, this is, I'm going to provide for you in just a little bit, um, a, a resource um, that tells you if you're billing a lab service or billing in certain places of service, the address needs to be included on your claim form. Uh, you would use the claim form instructions in the internet only manual and that crosswalk that I just showed you to determine where on the claim that needs to be reported. Claim must be submitted to another contractor. Now this is really similar to what I talked about earlier with the railroad board. In this case, the claim needs to be submitted to another contractor, not to WPS. Next is invalid, incorrect name, strength, and dosage of drug. And this it happens in those situations where you're billing for a J code uh, for a drug. Uh, some of the guidelines specific to uh, the use of some of the J codes for drugs tells you that you need to report in item 19 on the claim the name of the drug, the strength of the drug, and the dosage as well. So that is a common reason for rejection. Now I talked about the reasons for rejection. I thought it would be interesting for you if I included uh, some of the common rejections for specialty 18 claims by HCPCS and CPT codes. Uh, the 92134 is billing and coding, scanning, computerized, uh, ophthalmic diagnostic imaging. And for this code, uh, of course, the rejections or the, the remit are going to print out that the claim lacks information needed for adjudication. But the number one reason this is rejecting is because field 11 of the HICFA 1500, the CMS 1500, needs to be completed. We had almost 500 rejections because for that code for this reason. Um, missing information needed to adjudicate the claim. We have, uh, you know, when you see information like that, it should be a tip to you to look to policies to see if there is a local coverage determination um, that provides additional information about something that's needed to be reported on the claim in order to justify Medicare payment. And if you look at L34760, that's a local coverage determination. Um, this provides documentation that you must have to justify procedures. Um, these are procedures that would generally not be necessary uh, with this particular service. Uh, but when medically needed on the same day, there has to be documentation to justify the procedures, and that could be what's missing. The next code, 92014, um, is the um, ophthalmology services, medical exam and evaluation um, with initiation or continuation of diagnostic treatment program. It's comprehensive, established patient, one or more visits, reasons for denial, uh, claim lacks information needed for adjudication. Again, field 11 of the CMS 1500 must be completed. The second reason this code's being rejected is because it, the claim needs to be submitted to railroad. And the third is that the facility lab name or address is missing on the claim. Um, the 99214, similar. Field 11, the CMS has to be completed. Um, and this one, uh, another re reason for rejection is that the primary identifier for the provider wasn't valid or was missing. You know, check to make certain that was keyed correctly. Check to make sure it's there. Let's move on. 67028 is the intravitreal injection of pharmacologic agent, so, uh, separate procedure. Um, claim lacks information needed for adjudication. Field 11 of that CMS 1500 form must be completed. Um, next up is missing procedure modifier. I have um, a colleague who will be hosting a webinar in November uh, and the topic for her webinar will be targeted probe and educate topics for 2025 and this code is one of the TPE codes uh, on the list 
uh, for our Part B providers. So if you are interested in getting um, more information about the TPE for 67028 for 2025, um, keep your eye out on the, um, the postings on our live events webpage and in our Wednesday edition e-news um, so that you'll be able to register for that webinar. 92136 is the thalamic biometry by partial coherence interferometry with intraocular lens power calculation. Claim lacks information needed for adjudication. Invalid or missing procedure modifier is the reason here. I provided for you those um, I showed you rather demonstrated where you can find those modifier fact sheets to make certain that you are pending um, needed modifiers um, that are required when your claims being processed. Another reason for rejections is the rendering physician numbers invalid or missing. 99213, same thing, field 11 of the CMS 1500 must be completed, but for this code, um, this office visit code, the diagnosis is missing or not linked. You can't bill the patient. so. Uh, missing diagnosis, that's the one of the top reasons that one's being rejected. Uh, cataract extraction, 66984. Uh, reasons, uh, rendering physician number, invalid or missing. Field 11 of the CMS 1500 must be completed. Missing procedure modifier. 92250, um, same thing. Field 11 missing. Claim must be submitted to another contractor. Claim must be submitted to Railroad Retirement Board. Um, we have another... Um, Evaluation and Management Code. Um, this one is for the 99204 is for a um, initial visit and this code is being rejected because only one ENM code for service level is covered per course of care. Um, so if you have more than one individual billing an initial service um, within the same organization or even on different claims, different clinics, only one ENM code for that service level is going to be covered per course of care. And again, field 11 must be completed. Which brings us to the J code, J3590. This is being rejected because there is an invalid or incorrect name, strength, or dosage of drug, uh, or that's missing from the claim form altogether. Um, if you're billing that code, you do need to identify the, the drug name, the strength, and the dosage, and you need to place it in item 19 or the electronic equivalent. Um, this is also being denied be, or rejected. I caught myself there, folks. It's being rejected because field 11 is not completed, and the claim lacks information needed for adjudication. Let's move on and talk about denials. Uh, procedure code submitted is a non-covered service, 39,041 denials. This is no surprise, um, and sometimes when we analyze data, we see there is a reason why something is being denied so much. Um, this is for that refraction code, folks, and Medicare doesn't cover refraction, um, so this makes sense that the procedure code submitted is a non-covered service. Now, um, you don't need to submit a non-covered service to Medicare unless the beneficiary asks you to do so. Um, some providers submit it automatically uh, along with the, the eye exam that's being uh, billed on that day, but you really don't need to submit it at all. Um, the next one is uh, one that you're going to see pop up, not just for uh, ophthalmology providers, but a lot of providers, it's duplicate. Duplicate charge of a claim that's now being processed. This is a duplicate charge. Duplicate charge paid on such and such a day on claim number, um, and then there would be an ICN. Look at the numbers there, folks. 16,000, over 5,000, almost 6,000, 5,000 claims. Those are a lot of claims that are being submitted every month and being denied, or being submitted every day, I should say, and being denied because it's a duplicate charge. Um, we have long been trying to decrease the number of duplicate denials within our jurisdictions, but it keeps happening. If you use, you bill on a, a monthly cycle, or if you uh, hire a billing service who submits on a 30-day cycle, stop doing that. <laughs> it is costing you money, and it costs the Medicare program money. Medicare considers the repeated submission of duplicate charges to be abusive. Uh, repeated abuses can be viewed as fraud. Um, 
you should not submit duplicate charges to Medicare. Remember the payment floor. We have to hold payment on your claim for a certain number of days. So you need to wait longer than that 30 day billing cycle uh, if you're going to just resubmit your charges. Make sure that you're taking a look at your uh, remittance advice and you're checking to see if that service has been paid uh, before you resubmit or submit a new claim. Collection of fee for service during periods of managed care. What that means over 7,000 claims is that the patient is a um, has a Medicare Advantage plan should not have been submitted to WPS. Uh, service units of service are exceeded. That is the medically unlikely edits. Uh, we do expect to see some denials here because oftentimes a provider will submit um, a number in excess of the medically unlikely uh, edit number or that um, units of service that are allowed by Medicare. Uh, this is a situation where if you build in excess, you're going to need to submit your medical record documentation to show Medicare why you should be paid more than the Medicare MUE for that particular item of service. Separate payment not made for this service. This is a bundling uh, denial. Certain services cannot be, uh, payment for certain services cannot be made uh, it's because of bundling. Uh, what you'll need to look to here is look at the relative value units file that CMS publishes, relative units file. Um, it, it, it will tell you if, uh, by use of a status code, if that particular item or service is bundled. It will have a B status code on the relative value file on CMS's website. That means that service is bundled, always bundled. Medicare will never separately pay for the service. Next, field 11 of the CMS 1500 must be completed. So this, in addition to rejections, often shows up on the denials. Medicare will not pay for this service for this condition. 2200 denials, uh, that would be a situation where you need to look at the, uh, the policy for that particular item or service. Pulling something up here on my other screen. I'll pull it over in just a second here. Uh, I want to show you how you can look to see if a particular code or keyword appears in the title of one of our policies or in one of our local coverage determination articles. This is the home page of the WPS website right here on the left side just down from the top of the page is the code lookup tool. This is where you can uh, enter a number. Uh, if you type it correctly, uh, and do a search to see if a particular item or, uh, or code, title, or definition appears uh, in one of our local coverage determinations. You can also check, I guess I didn't uh, click it there. So I chose to enter 92134. Um, this is one of those services I talked about earlier have, as having being rejected. And you can either choose to open the article or the LCD itself. You can also choose to search national coverage determinations too by using this tool. So that folks would be a, a great resource for you if Medicare is denying your service because it won't pay for this service for this condition. You need to look to the, um, the local coverage determination article to see what diagnosis codes are covered for a particular item or service. Uh, claim must be sent to the EGHP first. This is Employer Growth Health Plan. That means this is a Medicare secondary payer situation. We have a lot of great uh, videos out on our YouTube channel that explain Medicare secondary payer situations. Uh, next is the physician supplier not eligible to receive payment. Almost 2,000 denials uh, for the time period that I looked at those claim submission dates, April through June. Um, this would be a situation where you're going to want to check the provider enrollment files uh, to make certain that um, the provider or supplier was indeed eligible to receive payment on that date of service. You might also want to check to see that that provider uh, number was entered correctly on the claim. Let's take a look at the common denials by code now. Uh, the 92015, of course, is that refraction code, makes sense, 41,000 denials. 92134, reason for denial is that Medicare will not pay for this service for this condition. I talked to you already about the fact that that code is in a local coverage determination. You need to look at the list of covered 
uh, ICD-10 codes uh, in the local coverage article to see which is and which is not payable. 67028, denying for duplicate, denying because patients are in managed care. And these services are not covered because the patient is in a hospice and timely filing. Those are the top four reasons that particular code is denying. 92014, managed care, duplicates, have to bill the employer group health plan first. So you can see a lot of these denials really don't have anything to do with the fact that that item or service is not covered by Medicare or doesn't meet policy um, requirements. They're being denied for other reasons. Duplicates, managed care, um, not covered when performed or ordered by this provider. Duplicates, I mentioned that already, or Medicare secondary payer situation. Similarly, the 99214, 99213 are denying for those same reasons. Um, 99024, this is a reporting code, so we would expect to see uh, denials for this service. It's separate payments not made for this service. It's used for reporting purposes only. So we understand why there are uh, three. 3,573 denials. These are global post-op visits and it's reporting purposes only. 92,250, payment is included in another, another surgery received on, um, the remit's going to tell you what, what date that other surgery was. This is bundled with other tests or services. Um, this is also denied for managed care. Uh, it's also being denied because it's duplicate and because it cannot be billed separately. It's a bundled service. 66984 is being denied mostly for duplicates, incorrect billing, split post-op care. That's the use of that 54 and 55 modifier. We do have recordings in our or on our YouTube channel um, that address this um, split billing of post-op care for cataract services, you know, the appropriate use of modifiers 54 and 55. On the reasons why cataract um, is being denied, managed care, uh, and then of course, um, I mentioned to you that we have the global surgery modifiers that you do need to use correctly when reporting this service. And unfortunately, um, I think one of the, the roadblocks here is that you don't always know what the other physician is submitting on his or her claim. Uh, so sometimes the computer logic doesn't understand why 54 on one claim um, can be allowed and when 55 was billed on another claim inappropriately. Maybe some of the information on the other claim wasn't entered correctly um, and that would make the other claim deny. Um, I know that there's been some questions about that. Why does mine sometimes pay and sometimes not pay? Well, you need to consider that that claim for the other portion of the the, um, the operative care or the global care is being submitted by someone else and you don't know what was submitted on their claim necessarily if they're from another group. Um, you don't have access to that information. So that could be what drives the reason why your claim is being rejected. Uh, 92136, duplicates, managed care and not covered when performed, referred or ordered by this provider. I just want to um, let you know that I mentioned to you that we do the breakdown uh, of data I did for all of the, the states in our jurisdictions, but we really can drill down even to county. I'm doing some provider or partner presentations next month up in Michigan and actually drilled down that data so that I could show what are the denials in this county. Um, so um, just we have this information available. We can also look at trending and here's an example of trending uh, for denials. And this particular one is that the time limit for filing your claim has expired, no appeal right. That data dashboard that we can look at gives us the claim count for the current three months, 815 denials for this reason. The claim count the prior three months was 366. The difference in the number of claims between those two three month periods was 449. That means the percentage of change for this denial was 123% of an increase. Uh, and this is what helps us, um, you know, determine uh, our, our education in the future. Um, do we need to educate on this? And yes, we do. Uh, in fact, I just had one of my colleagues uh, do a, a webinar a while back. We recorded that webinar. It's available out on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to show you that we have on our website 
timely filing of claims. I just searched timely filing because I know this resource is there. This tells you uh, what you can bill the patient uh, on a claim denied for late filing. Um, these claims do not have appeal rights. I mentioned to you earlier that for most claims that are denied with few exceptions, you have appeal rights. Um, this is one of those exceptions. Uh, and this is, um, I think most often, the reason why we, re we get requests for appeals, um, and we shouldn't because it's not appealable, um, for denied claims that aren't filed within time limits and that are due to a third party error. And this happens when that other insurance is gonna pay for it, a service and then they, they come back years later and take the money back. Um, your timely filing, period has expired for Medicare, you can't submit a claim anymore. Um, this is the CMS citation in their internet only manual that states third party payer errors in making primary payment determination does not constitute good cause for the purposes of reopening an initial determination or redetermination uh, when we process the claim. Um, this is the, the citation that we will use to say that we can't reopen the claim. We can't um, waive timely filing if it's a third party error. However, we do know and recognize that there are potential reasons where we may need to extend that late time. Uh, filing limit. And rather than requesting an appeal, folks, what you need to do is file that waiver to extend the timely filing unit. And this is where it tells you uh, how to do that and where to send that request. Now, um, I'm on the J8 Mac Part B website, so you'll notice where to send it. Addresses are Indiana and Michigan. If you're J5, go up here to the top and choose your jurisdiction, J5 Mac Part B. And you'll see the same information, however, it's for our J5 states. So remember that you need to make certain that you're viewing the correct jurisdiction on the website when you're getting information like that. Uh, resources and tools, real quick, um, I'm down to just a couple minutes left. Um, I had so much information to share with you. Um, here are those resources and tools. These are the claims filing requirements and that crosswalk that I showed you. Uh, we have a resource specific for rejections. Uh, I talked about reason and remark codes later, earlier in the presentation that tell you uh, on your remittance advice or that explain why we rejected something. This particular um, resource on our website gives, um, gives you how to identify and correct unprocessable or rejected claims and it's listed by remarks code. So based on that remark code that prints out on your remit, you can go out to this great resource and find how to fix it. Uh, this, similarly, we have a resource for denials. Uh, for these, we break them out into categories. Is it a global surgery denial? Is it a duplicate denial, a bundling denial? Is it a provider number denial? This resource tells you how to uh, avoid those in the future. And what you need to do if you submit a, a request for an appeal. Here's our website. We have MSP questions and answers. Several of the rejections and denials I talked about today had to do with um, another insurance as primary. Send it to the EGHP, remember the employer group health plan. Here's our live events webpage. It tells you upcoming education. Encore presentations is the webpage that has recordings of our uh, webinars. And then I mentioned several times today, YouTube channel. How do you determine whether the patient has traditional or original Medicare as opposed to a Medicare Advantage plan? Some of the denials I talked about today um, were evaluation and management services. We actually have playlists, not just for evaluation and management services, but other services as well. So I would uh, recommend that you take a look at the YouTube channel. There's a lot of great videos out there for e evaluation and management services. I was out there earlier today looking at them. We have 47 uh, recordings just about E&M services. Uh, here's other resources, that modifiers webpage, Clinical lab and reference lab services coding guidelines. Uh, we didn't have any labs that hit your denials, but in the event, in the event you do have laboratory services that would deny, I wanted to include that. Billing and describing an NOC code. This could be a drug NOC code, those J codes. What is it you need to provide to Medicare and where do you need to put it on the claim? 
This is what tells you that. Timely filing of claims. We want to partner with you. I talked about a little bit earlier today that I have some events coming up in Michigan. Um, if you belong to a society or association and you would like this information explained to your association or society, there is a uh, partnership request form on our website that allows you to invite us to be a speaker in person or uh, virtually. There's also a link here on this page to provider enrollment guides and resources uh, because a lot of the rejections and denials have to do with missing uh, information on the claim form that pertains to uh, the provider's enrollment. That is it entered correctly. Track. provider to the rendering provider. Eligible to order and refer and gives their provider ID number. Uh, that this review contractor directory is a great um, interactive map. You can click on any state and find out where do I send it if the patient, the claim, if the patient has um, railroad. Uh, where do I send it, you know, if it's a hospice patient, so on and so forth. Uh, I know I skipped over a couple of these in the, in the interest of time. These are all things I talked about today. I just wanted to put all of the resources in one place so you could quickly come back to these pages and find what you needed. Uh, Medicare Advantage resources. We get a ton of claims that are for patients who have a Medicare Advantage plan and not traditional original Medicare. Uh, more CMS resources, eligibility issues. Um, they've prepared this fact sheet about checking Medicare eligibility. Of course, you can use the, um, the self-service tools that WPS offers too in order to get that information. How to use the Medicare coverage database. This is the national depository, searchable depository of both national and local uh, policies. So in addition to looking, using that lookup tool that I showed you on our website, you can use this Medicare coverage database to find WPS local coverage determinations as well. Uh, interactive voice response system. This is just one of the self-service tools that you can use to find claim status and details. We offer an operating guide for you. Also, our portal. I talked about this several times today. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just like the IVR. Uh, we do have that portal user manual available. I do want to show you uh, that if you're out on the WPS website, on every single page, right here is that portal user manual that you can link to. has illustrations and step-by-step -step instructions uh, for using all of the functionalities of our transactional portal. This brings us to questions and answers. I am now three minutes over, folks, so I will promise to you that if you submitted a question via the chat, uh, that I will respond to you either directly or I will compile a list of the questions and the answers. Um, I apologize, we ran a little bit over there. Um, thanks for attending. Our greatest compliment is when you recommend our education to others, please help us reach our goal to provide current and effective education for everyone in our jurisdiction by recommending our education. On behalf of myself and Karen and the entire provider outreach and education team, I want to thank you for your participation. We do look forward to those survey comments and we hope to have you join us for future events. You may now disconnect. Thanks everybody.